everybody, Cody Broderick here with Brady Broadbent. Really good friend, amazing guy, Harvard grad, brains for days, helps the community out so much because he works at Sorensen Capital and he's helping identify the companies that are poised for growth, poised for success, poised for a ton of international expansion. So very thankful for what Sorensen's doing, what Brady does um, in our community. So on the Global Growth Podcast, as everybody knows, we're talking about these companies that are moving quick, that are scaling up, some of the best practices and things that you know these CEOs or um, the executive team can kind of be aware of. And I like to take the approach of sort of from your perspective. You've got obviously a deep you know, business background and financial background, but just a few questions we'll run with today. So with every all this change that's going on in tech and development, a lot of changes actually in, in raising money and the way it's done, what are some of the things, maybe top tips that just come to mind for you that CEOs or executive teams should really be aware of as they're starting to scale rapidly around the world? Yeah, so you know the biggest thing is you don't want to build for the short term, you want to build for the long term. So when we talk about, um, when companies talk about raising money or we talk about providing capital for growth, that capital should be provided for the purpose of a long-term vision. And I think where companies get messed up in that whole process is thinking about, okay, I need capital so I can do X. When in reality, it should be a step along the process of long-term value creation, right? So I think that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I would say is choose your partners really wisely. Make sure that not only on the capital side, but on the people that you hire and so forth, that you, you work with people that you work well with, right? If it's fun, if it's enjoyable, the outcome's going to be a lot better. So, I mean, at Sorensen, I mean, I, what, how big is the port, the, the, your, the portfolio? Fund. Yeah, so we invest out of a fund that's between 400 and 500 million dollars uh, right now. Every five years or so, we'll raise another fund just right. so we can continue to invest. So obviously, seen a lot of companies and a lot doing, right. you know, international work. Can you share with us maybe a success story, real quick, about a company that just did things right, or maybe there's a couple of decisions they made here or there that just made a big difference that that might be helpful to understand that. Yeah, I, I won't drop names <laughs> for confidentiality, but um, you know, there's every company will go through a cycle in its history. You know, things will go really well, and then you'll have a hiccup. And the companies that I think have really long-term success are the companies that understand the the um, the specific metrics that are going to govern the success or failure of their business. A lot of that is unit economics and their go-to-market strategy. A lot of it is how much money they're spending on developing a product, not only now, for, but for long-term domination in their market, right? And so I, I think that um, you know, the success stories come from folks that constantly are adjusting and watching those metrics and pulling on the levers that make sense. Do I spend more money in marketing? Do I hire more salespeople? What types of salespeople do I hire? Are they efficient? Which markets? What types of customers do I go after? If you can really hone those business metrics in the early days of a company, and then continually uh, improve those metrics over time, that will help you to be successful in the long run. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. If you were to give your 20-year-old self advice, looking back, what would it be? Um, great question. Uh, I think I would say uh, find passion in, in personal, continuous personal improvement. Uh, I think if you're passionate about becoming the best version of yourself, which is a lifelong pursuit, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, you'll enjoy it, right? Because there's, there's a there's great reward and satisfaction that comes from improvement, personal improvement. Yeah, self-mastery, lifelong journey for sure. Absolutely. So uh, if I were to ask you, you know, genre of music, would you rather play 80s or 90s, what, what would it be? Definitely 90s. Yeah. The 90s? Yeah. yeah I was That's born a first. In the 80s, I was born in the 80s, yeah. yeah but the, ni like the 90s are, the, yeah. hey, it's good. It's good. I would go back to the 80s, though. The, the challenge for me, though, is I actually like country as well. So that, kind, oh, that, interesting. that just throws the whole thing into a mix. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I, have you ever been to a Garth concert? I have not, although it's on the list. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Garth concert. I, you know, it was the hype before, like, Garth. And then I went, and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> this that is man incredible. has passion. Yes. <laughs> Energy for days. Yeah, it was really good. So, uh... Do you, uh, do you think that pineapple should be allowed on pizza? No. 
<laughs> right? It's an abomination. It's horrible. It's a, hor it's a horrible no thing. Fruit ever. Yeah. If there isn't meat on your pizza, there's something, you're missing the point, yeah. in my opinion. I totally agree wholeheartedly. It's crazy. On the subject of cheese pizza, what, uh, what's your favorite cheese? Um, I'm a Swiss guy, specifically Jarlsberg Swiss. Ooh, yes. nice. I like yeah. you get specific there, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love cheese. Nice. Cheese is great. Yeah, Steak everybody cheese is. Cheese is a little aggressive for me, but yeah. I like Some of the sharp stuff. Yeah, yeah, Swiss is good. Okay. Um, if you were to give maybe one or two pieces of advice for a company doing international business, kind of keep their eye on it, what would it be? Yeah, good question. So um, I think one of the areas where companies can have false starts internationally, especially when you're, you've got a nice footprint domestically and you're trying to expand, right? is you choo choosing markets that are a bad fit for your product can be a massive setback. And it happens very, very frequently. You know, folks might say, okay, well look, let's go to China because China's a big market. Well, China may not be set up to consume the product that you're offering. Whereas the UK might be a really good fit for that. So going through the analysis in a very thoughtful way up front and figuring out the go-to-market differences in those in those markets is, I think, you know, going to improve the likelihood of success. I, I've been involved in situations where, you know, it's like, okay, what's the biggest market? Let's go after that market. When in reality, your adoption in a smaller market might be way faster. So I think those are some of the key things you got to do. The other thing is hiring a team that not only knows your product but actually knows that international market is critical. So, favorite question of mine that I like to ask everybody is, you know, you've, you've been obviously, I mean, going to Harvard for grad school, working, I mean, you guys have got to be so selective about the types of companies that you actually invest in and how many you vet out. Sure. So, you're looking at a lot of entrepreneurs and teams. What is the difference that makes the difference in your, in your mind? The difference if it's an individual... What's the difference that makes a difference? Yeah, so before I answer that, just one comment. So one, it, uh, it, you know, if you're running a company and for whatever reason it's not a good fit for an investor, that really has no bearing on your likelihood of success. Uh, there are, the, the most of the economy, from my perspective, comes from businesses that are, that are bootstrapped, that are by entrepreneurs that are just building their business in the best way they know how. So don't let that be a barrier of, of success or failure. But from our perspective, given the hurdles that we have, um, you know, I think one of the big things that makes a difference, I, I, there's sort of two things, and it, it, it's all about the team, but what does the team have, right? That's the difference. First is the ability to execute. And I know that's a, maybe a cliche term, but what does that mean? It means that you get stuff done quickly, efficiently, that you make decisions quickly and efficiently with the best data that you have. Making a quick decision based on good data is better than waiting for perfect data. Um, so I think that's critical. And then the second is having a product in your market that is truly a leading product. We heard about that this morning a little bit. Um, product leadership is really, really critical. And that doesn't mean that you have to have something that is never, you know, nobody else can replicate. It means that you do it better than the next guy. Um, and I think if you can do those two things in a big market, I think that's probably pillar number three you'll be in a really good place. You know, you can have a great team and a great product in a really small, mar small market. It's gonna be hard to have a great outcome. Yeah. yeah, there's a quote by Tony Robbins, execution trumps knowledge. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you on executing that way. Um, let's see, I had one more question. Kind of lost it there for a second. Um, it was a good one though. Oh, yeah, we're at a tech summit. Um, there's a lot of people here. There's lots of tech tools. There's lots of apps. Is there one or two that you use in business or personally or that you like that you recommend to people? To kind of manage my own life? Or, or yeah, like maybe stuff you guys use internally at Sorensen that's like a Slack or like um, is there something that helps you stay productive or help you, help you follow up with things? Or yeah, so it's a good question. So um, we actually use a CRM platform based on Salesforce that's really helpful. But I think generally speaking, it, if you're a paper guy, use paper. If you're a whiteboard guy, use whiteboard. If you're an Outlook guy, use Outlook. But managing the, your vision and then the tactical progress that you're making daily, sometimes multiple times a day, just to ensure that your execution is happening in the, in the quickest fashion is really, really critical. I know people who have notebooks and they cross stuff off and it's really satisfying to cross something off, right? <laughs> I know people who use, yeah. I know people who use task lists or apps for task lists or whatever, that's fine too. Just manage it and manage yourself and your own progress in a, in a deliberate way, and it'll help you be successful. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate it so much. Appreciate you being on.